Kwe Kwe, good afternoon, bonjour. Um, welcome, Apsalaji, to the Federalism Structures and Relationships Dis with Indigenous Peoples discussion. Delawisi Danielle White, Wadapegzi Nujokonek Oktahamkuk. My name is Danielle White. I come from Mi'kmaq territory on the west coast of Newfoundland. I'm a member of the Halibut Mi'kmaq First Nation, and I am the. Uh, I will be your moderator for today. I'm the Assistant Deputy Minister of Strategic Policy and Partnerships at Indigenous Services Canada, and I'm joining you today from beautiful unceded Algonquin territory where I now live and work. We have a very exciting event planned for you this afternoon. And just before we proceed, I wanted to mention a couple of housekeeping items. To optimize your viewing experience, we recommend disconnecting from your VPN or use a personal device to watch the session. Nous avons aussi la traduction simultanée en français. Um, ces services sont disponibles par uh, le, le web, le, l'audio diffusion was the webcast. So we have French uh, simultaneous translation in French um, and you can access that service through the webcast. Uh, you can refer to the reminder email for the details on how to access, uh, access this option. So now, uh, before we begin, I would like to welcome uh, Algonquin Anishinaabe Knowledge Keeper, Manik Manach, uh, to start us off in a good way and open today's event with a prayer. Manik, stavu. Miigwech and Pajashik, welcome. Welcome to unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin territory. Monique Manach and Deshnikas, Kitakanik and Ishnobek and Dojaba. My name is Monique Manach and I'm a member of the Algonquins of Barrier Lake. And, um, and so I'd like to uh, open this space in a, in a good way to help bring our minds together, to help uh, to create a, a safe space where we can speak from our hearts. Um, where we can speak our truth and our honesty, uh, a space where we can share and learn from each other. And I'll do that with a few words to the creator. Thank you. Thank you for the water, for the plants, for the trees, for the ones who fly, for the ones who swim, for the ones who crawl, for the furred, for the feathered, for the four-legged and for the two-legged. And thank you for bringing everyone together here today with open hearts, with open minds. Help us to see truth. Help us to hear beauty. Help us to speak with kindness and with compassion. And help us to work together for the benefit of all of our communities. Kachimigwich, 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 kachimigwich. Thank you very much. I know you're going to have a great meeting today. Thanks. Msit Nogama, miigwech manik for that uh, for that reflection. Uh, I'd now like to welcome uh, Jiyun Han to get us uh, started and to provide an overview of the topic for discussion today. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you for joining us, everyone. My name is Jiyun Han, and I am a research associate at the Institute for Research on Public Policy Center of Excellence on the Canadian Federation. This event is the fourth in a series created through a partnership between the school and the Center on Contemporary Issues in Canadian Federalism. I'll just say a few words to introduce today's discussion, connecting it to the themes presented in the first three events, and then we'll pass it back over to Danielle. Let me start by acknowledging that the land from which I'm talking to you is the unceded traditional territory of the Ganyang Ginhaga. I recognize that we all work in different places and therefore you work on a different traditional indigenous territory. Please take a moment to consider the original peoples of the land you are on. Thank you. So far in the series, we have held three events. We've covered several foundational issues in federalism, including why federalism matters, fiscal federalism, and the role of federalism in economic development and infrastructure. If you haven't tuned into our previous events, I encourage you to do so. Throughout the series, one question that has persisted from the audience is how do Indigenous people fit into the conversations we've had so far about federalism? This question touches upon a theme we've been exploring in the background of several of our events so far, a new vision of federalism that is not limited to just the federal and provincial governments as the main actors in our governance structure, but one that includes a wider network of actors that better reflects governance in Canada, including and amongst the most important Indigenous people. Today, we will hear from our speakers on their observation on how Indigenous people interact with the current landscape of federalism structures. Now for the main event, I'll pass it back over to our moderator, Danielle. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jiyun. So today we have three outstanding speakers, each with their own unique experiences and expertise uh, on the topic for discussion. I'd like to introduce Darcy Gray, who's a former chief of Listigush Mi'kmaq First Nation. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Mi'kmaq territory, uh, Darcy comes from the other end. <laughs> I'm from Newfoundland. It stretches all the way to, uh, to the eastern part of Quebec. Um, Catherine McCory is another a longtime friend and colleague. Uh, she's a fellow at Carleton's uh, School of Public Policy and Administration and is currently uh, holding a leadership role in the Rebuilding First Nations Governance Project with the First Nations Governance Center. Um, but Catherine is also a longtime a federal and territorial public servant. And then um, finally, we have Martin Papillon, who's assistant professor at the University of Montreal and uh, director of the Centre de Recherche sur les Politiques et le Développement Social. Um, so we'll ask Martin to start us off by providing a bit of an overview on the division of powers and take us through some of the contemporary issues in federalism and Indigenous relations. Catherine will then talk about the role of the public servant when it comes to policy making and implementation uh, in areas that affect Indigenous peoples. And then Darcy will speak to his own personal experience as both a chief and counselor uh, at Listagoos First Nation and the impact of federalism uh, on his community. Then we'll move into a discussion of the issues raised um, during the presentations and we'll take some questions for our panelists. Uh, and for the Q&A portion, um, please go to the top right corner of your screen and click on the chat button and you can enter your question. Uh, don't worry if you don't see it appear in the chat, the moderator will be able to see it or the, um, the, the tech team will be able to see it and then we'll, uh, we'll provide the questions to me as moderator and we will try to get through as many as we can. Um, so without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Martin Papillon, uh, who will walk us through a brief presentation. So Martin, over to you. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, everyone, for being here. It's a pleasure uh, to, to be here. I'm the, uh, I guess I'm the academic in the room, so I have a more academic -y presentation or role. Uh, so yes, I'll... Um, I'll talk in very fairly broad terms about the, uh, the topic that is of interest today, uh, Indigenous people and Canadian federalism. Uh, I have a PowerPoint presentation, so I will uh, share my screen if you bear with me for a second. Uh, there we go. Can everyone see the slides? I'm assuming yes. All right. So um, uh, just to get us started, the picture you're seeing there is uh, it was taken at uh, Mushwanipi. Mushwanipi is a, uh, along the George River in northern Quebec, along the uh, Labrador borders boundaries, and it's um, uh, it's traditional territory of the Innu people. And I'm uh, I'm grateful to the Innu people who invited me to this uh, sacred site uh, last summer, and I've uh, certainly learned a lot from that uh, that uh, that moment. So I wanted to put that picture there to um, to acknowledge that. So. Um, my um, my goal my goal today is to really do a, a general overview, but I, I want to start with a, um, a bit of a question on optics uh, because I think it's important. When we talk about federalism, we generally talk about a system of government where authority is shared and divided between two or more orders of government. This is the way our our, our system of government operates. And it's generally important that these orders of government are considered equal in status. There's many other aspects to federalism, uh, constitutionally written division of powers, a, a judiciary, autonomous judiciary that is uh, adjudicating on disputes. Uh, each orders of governments have their own legislative, of course, and executives and so on and so forth. So this is the traditional understanding of federalism. But federalism as a principle can take multiple forms. Uh, and a, a number of uh, indigenous academics are arguing that, you know, alliance and treaties between indigenous people and the crown uh, that pre-existed the creation of our federation were in fact a form of federalism. There was there, and even before that, indigenous people themselves had their own uh, federal type arrangement between each other. So federalism as a principle pre-exists the Canadian Federation in Canada. Uh, and that, that principle is still very much driving, and I don't wanna speak on behalf of all indigenous people, of course, but when I, in, as part of my research, when I talk to indigenous leaders and indigenous intellectuals and, and ordinary citizens, uh, especially in the context of, of treaties, uh, that notion of a nation to nation relationship or a, a partnership between equals is extremely important still today. 
In fact, it's a driving force of the way these relations uh, ought to be organized according to many. So I wanted to say that because uh, we tend to ask ourselves how we see the challenge as a challenge of fitting Indigenous governments and Indigenous people into the Canadian Federation. But I think this is wrong. I think the right way to approach this is really to see uh, uh, or, or, or to sort of reconceive our relationship as a, a, a coexistence between two types of federalism. The, our federation, federal, provincial, territorial, and so on and so forth, but also the federal tradition that is not a federal system, but is a federal kind of relationship between Indigenous people and the Canadian federation itself as a whole. And looking at it this way helps us, I think, put into perspective both uh, the di division of powers in the Canadian federation, the role of federal and provincial governments, the difficulties in, 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 in creating the space for recognizing Indigenous governments, but also the, the, the sort of potential path forward. So uh, let me jump right into it because I don't have a lot of time. Um, I wanna talk a bit about the, the, the sort of colonial foundations, if you want, of our federal system very briefly. As, as we all know, I think now, um, indigenous people were not invited when it was time to negotiate the terms of the uh, uh, 1867 uh, Federation, Confederation. Right? The division of powers between federal and provincial governments that was negotiated at the time did not include Indigenous people or Indigenous governments. They were not consulted either. You know? And so, uh, but of course, they are part of the federal system in a sense that they have become a head of jurisdiction under Section 9124, a head of jurisdiction of the federal government. Uh, that unilateral decision under which Indigenous people were never really consulted uh, does nonetheless create a unique relationship between the federal authority and indigenous people. It creates a, a relationship quite unique in the sense that there are no other population group in Canada that have this unique relationship with the federal government. Some, some rights are protected in our constitution, language rights, so on and so forth, but there's not an exclusive jurisdiction on a group of people uh, uh, in elsewhere in our constitution. Uh, so but this is very consistent, and I don't want to go into the details because I don't have time, but it's very consistent with the history of colonialism in Canada, including the Royal, Royal Proclamation of 1763, that did create that kind of uh, exclusive relationship between the Crown this, uh, and, and Indigenous people, which is the foundation of historic treaties, for example. So uh, the idea really between uh, behind this uh, exclusive protection or, or jurisdiction was really to create a protection for indigenous people against the interest of provinces and local interests. Why? Because it is in provincial governments, which were the old colonial governments, the local governments, um, that are vested the interest on the land and resource and the expansion right, of, uh, of the settler society. So the, the idea of having the federal government responsible was to create a sort of protection, but it's also a highly paternalistic protection in the sense that indigenous people are considered under section uh, 9124, more or less as wards of states. And this, this became more concrete with the Indian Act, of course, later on. Um, but section 9124 did not create a watertight jurisdictional wall in the sense that uh, it is not because it's a head of jurisdiction exclusive to the federal government that indigenous people are not interacting with the provinces or that provinces don't have a role to play in relations with the indigenous people. And this is often something that is misunderstood in Canada, I think. We tend to think, oh, because of Section 9124, it's just the federal government that deals with uh, indigenous people. Well, it's not true. It's not true for a number of reasons, but I just point two here that are, I think, pretty important. First, many heads of powers of provincial governments are key to uh, the well-being, the survival, and the relationship to the land that indigenous people have. And I, I only mentioned a few here, land and resources, of course, the administration of justice, public safety, but also all the social programs is, that, are, uh, that are important. Uh, and, and, and provinces have been very, pro provinces have, have, have historically been very proactive at seeking to expand our jurisdiction on, on indigenous land for obvious economic reasons, but I've also paradoxically been very reluctant to expand their role, notably on social policies. 
for cost reasons, for financial reasons, obviously. So there's this tension that is inherent in the role of provinces. Federal government, on the other hand, uh, have, um, have interpreted their role, success, success of federal governments, uh, in uh, in fairly restrictive ways, and 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 this is also important to understand. Uh, the federal government early on could have taken a, a much more proactive, systematic role in engaging in relationship with indigenous people and in sheltering indigenous people from provincial interests. They have chosen not to. And the reason, obviously, is that Section 9124 was seen at the time as something temporary until Indigenous people assimilate into the broader polity. So, uh, so they chose to focus solely, solely on status Indians with the Indian Act. Um, they, they've had, over time, a very selective uh, uh, approach to social policy, being active on education, fairly active, but in other social policies, much less so. There's different reasons for this, but uh, uh, but it's important to see that there is a variation. There's a lot of inconsistency as to what the federal government does and does not do. Uh, and in terms of uh, of who uh, uh, what who in terms of status, who is under federal uh, policy authority or not. So uh, also very selective funding. Some programs are funded, other less so. So it's a very complicated jurisdictional landscape that I've come out of this history of reluctant engagement of the provincial government, uh, federal government, sorry. So some of the consequences, very quickly, some of the consequences of this even today, uh, what I call the responsibility gap. It's not always clear who should do what and how in relation with indigenous people. And I'm sure that our other guests will have concrete examples of this from their own experience. Um, and I just mentioned a number of areas, but who is providing, uh, who is establishing the rules and boundaries? And depending where you live as an indigenous person, if you live on reserve, off reserve, depending on your status, if you're status Indians, if you're Métis, if you're off non-status, there's a lot of diversity. And this creates a responsibility gap in the sense that a lot of people fall into the cracks, right? And it's it, it's not clear who's responsible for what, and hence what, which programs apply, who's supposed to pay for such and such services. And there are many, many examples of this, which we can talk about more in detail later. It also creates a funding gap. Uh, responsibility comes with, with expenditures, obviously. So who is responsible to fund for example, social programs for indigenous people, well, depending on status, depending on where you live, uh, and so on and so forth, it varies quite a lot. And so there's a lot of uh, tensions there, and also discrepancies between uh, programs that are funded by provinces and programs that are funded by uh, uh, the federal government. Education is the most obvious example, but there are many others. Uh, it also creates multiplication of rules, accountability practice, and so on and so forth, because it's not clear who is responsible for what. The tendency is to create mechanisms and rules on both sides. And so indigenous organizations and governments often face the multiplications of uh, accountability measures and rules and so on and so forth. And the most example, the most obvious example I could find, there are many others, is in child welfare. I mean, there's a new legislative framework for child welfare now, but for the longest time, for example, on reserves in most of the country, but there were some exceptions, including Ontario, the federal government was funding the programs. They were run by indigenous uh, local organizations directly by the federal government or by the province, according to the provincial standards. And so you had two kind of different uh, orders of government playing their role there and ex having expectations about the cost and the ex expectations about rules and so on and so forth. So this made it extremely heavy and complicated. And it does create what I call a gridlock for indigenous governing authorities that are seeking to assert their autonomy. It's become very difficult to come out of this multiplications of rules. Uh, so uh, looking forward, looking today, I think the challenge is really one of uh, properly acknowledging and rec not recognizing our, uh, the coexistence of multiple federal forms of our state at the beginning, but more concretely also to disentangle this jurisdictional web to create space for indigenous people to assert their own authority uh, uh, on their uh, communities and lands. Uh, but of course, the, the, the take home message of all this is that the federal government, since, since the audience here is mostly connected with the federal government, the federal government cannot do this alone. 
And, and, and so it's not just federal policies that matters. And this is really important. Of course, indigenous people matter. You can't do that without their collaboration and their initiative. But it's also important that provinces and territories uh, be part of that change, be part of that story. And this is, this is a part that is often missing. Uh, I've underscored the importance of provinces and territories, well, the territories less, uh, in that story. And, and really, changes will only come if we pay attention to this reality that it's not a bilateral thing, despite what we would like. Sometimes it is really more uh, complex than this. I just want to, to conclude with a, a couple recent developments that I think are relevant to think about this disentanglement uh, and, and think about this, the, the reconstruction of these relationships. Uh, first, the timing is, is right right now. It's important because conceptually and, and also discursively, but also just in terms of the reception of the broader society to these issues has never been greater. And the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has played a really important role in this. Uh, the developments related to the United Nations declarations on the rights of indigenous people is also, are, are also important. It's a really fundamental document that pr proposed a, con well, not a concrete, but a set of principle of standards um, uh, that uh, to, to reconcile our, 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 our Canadian Federation with, with, with indigenous governments. And these, these really, these ideas, these norm, these standards, these principles are really permeating everywhere in the Canadian society now. And so the awareness is much greater, which creates political momentum and, and really we should not lose that momentum because it's important right now. Uh, another uh, thing I want to mention is, of, I haven't mentioned yet section 91, uh, section 35 of the Constitutional Act 1982, which recognized Aboriginal and treaty rights, recognize and protect Aboriginal and treaty, treaty rights. This, of course, had a really important impact also on federal provincial dynamics. I just want to in, insist on the, the impact it's had on provinces because it's really important. And it's because Section 35 rights, uh, provinces are also uh, uh, bound by, uh, by Section 35, so they have to up uphold uh, Aboriginal and treaty rights, but they also are responsible for uh, what has emerged as a really important part of this, which is the duty to consult, the obligation for governments to consult Indigenous people when they're infringing or possibly infringing their rights. And the duty to consult has become a massive thing. There's massive amounts of consultations. Many in the audience are aware of that, probably. Uh, it's a big thing, and it's not always done right, it's not always well done, but it's important because what it does for provinces and territories, I should add, is really to force these governments to engage concretely with indigenous communities on the ground and develop partnerships, collaboration mechanisms to ensure that this consultation takes place. And so this is really changing the landscape. It forces the provincial governments to really develop their capacity in engaging more systematically and more institutionally with indigenous people in a way, especially on reserves, in a way that uh, they were not before. And I'm just give, giving you a graph here. Uh, I, I, I did not put too much, too much data here, but this is just one that I find really striking. It's the number of indigenous provincial agreements per year over the year in the past, well, since 1995. And as you can see, there's a massive growth somewhere in the early 2000s. And this is really connected to the Supreme Court jurisprudence on the duty to consult. And, and the, the growth is really more prominent in one province in particular, British Columbia. Why? Because in the early 2000s, British Columbia did a 180 degree turn in their approach to indigenous policy and really embrace this agenda of negotiating agreements with indigenous people to formalize, to institutionalize the relationship. Uh, some say it works well, some say it works less well, but, uh, uh, but it's a very striking and important development. And it really, uh, it really brings to fore the point that I was making that provinces and territories are important partners now in that reconfiguration of the relationship. Very quickly, a couple other developments that I find really important. The, uh, this is not new, but it, it's, it's, it's present and we have to mention it. Of course, modern treaties and self-government agreements, especially in Northern Territories, but not exclusively, there's some in Labrador and Quebec, in, Br in British Columbia as well, um, 
They're really important. Why? Because they, they, they do create a new type of political and really uh, legal relations, both with federal and provincial and territorial governments. Uh, the, these treaties and the self-government agreements that are associated with them, some of them are uh, benefit from constitutional protection under Section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982. Um, but more broadly, uh, even if they're just legislated, uh, they do recognize some heads of powers for indigenous governments. And so the nature of the relationship, including the fiscal obligation of federal and provincial government to fund these governments is really of a different order than what we're normally seeing, uh, notably under the Indian Act. So this is probably the closest we have in Canada to the notion of a third order of government in our federal system, and it's really important as a development. Uh, the last thing I want to mention, more at the policy level, it's really interesting to note the extent to which policy development, the way we develop policy in relation to Indigenous issues and policies has changed slowly, probably not enough, but certainly uh, I'm talking about examples of collaborative policy process at the federal and provincial level, where policy is developed really through a collaboration, collaborative process with indigenous organization. I, I can name the example of the collaborative fiscal policy process with self-governing indigenous governments that has been fairly successful. Um, Another interesting way or approach with this is tripartite agreements, federal and territorial and provincial federal uh, and indigenous, sorry, governments, so tripartite model of policy development. I can mention the tripartite agreement on health in British Columbia as a, as a good example. Um, and of course, there's the growing engagement of Indigenous organization in our intergovernmental relations mechanism at the first minister's meetings, but also at the administrative and ministerial uh, level. I have data on this that I'm not going to show, but it's quite striking the extent to which Indigenous organizations are more and more systematically engaged in what used to be a fairly exclusive federal provincial club of intergovernmental relations. So let me conclude to, uh, by saying that these developments, of course, are significant. They're changing uh, how we approach our relationship. But of course, we're still far away from the, the imagined model that I was talking at the beginning with two kinds of federal system coexisting. We're really far from that. And there's many structural and practical obstacles to developing this. But I'm optimistic in the sense that I do see the changes incrementally happening, and I do see that uh, you know things are evolving at many levels, and we can talk of more specific examples in the discussion if you want. So um, I've already spent my time, so I'm, I think I'm going to close my presentation and uh, let uh, everyone else uh, speak. There you go. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Malte. Um In a very short period of time, you've walked us through a very um, complex historical and legal context that I think is key to understanding and you did it in a very clear way so that was uh, tremendously helpful. I'll pass it over now to uh, to Catherine to share her perspective. Thanks very much Danielle. Bonjour tout le monde. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm a Métis woman who was born in Alberta but raised in the Northwest Territories and uh, now make my home uh, on uh, unceded Algonquin territory here in Ottawa. Um, really thrilled to, to be with these uh, two other panelists today. Martin doesn't know this, but uh, I've enjoyed his writings over the years. And uh, one of the things I read in preparation for this that I really recommend to you is uh, a book chapter uh, that's fairly recent, I think, called Nation to Nation. Um, and uh, it looks at federalism and uh, in Indigenous peoples and uh, very well written and uh, uh, very interesting. And then, of course, I get to work with Darcy uh, on the Rebuilding First Nations Governance Project that uh, that we have uh, running across Canada. So I'm looking forward to some of the very real day-to-day -day practical examples that Darcy can share with you about uh, some of the, the challenges of uh, intergovernmental relationships. Um, I will talk about the role of public servants, uh, but I do want to cover a little bit of history, too, so that you have a good sense of the frame with which I and my colleagues on the project uh, look at these issues. Um, but I also want to start with a little story about when I first came to Ottawa in 1998. Um, I was uh, one of the early directors of the uh, self-government policy unit and one of my responsibilities was for uh, coordinating the processes, the interdepartmental processes that mandated all the self-government um, and land claims tables. 
uh, and also helped advise uh, and recommend to government uh, the final agreements for those uh, negotiations. Um, uh, those sort of interpartmental discussions were always challenging, as you can well imagine, uh, probably still are today in many cases, Daniel's nodding. <laughs> um, but I remember particularly one day, um, a, an unnamed person from an unnamed department, as we were sort of kind of concluding some of the tough language around a final agreement, sort of went, ah, so if we sign this, does that mean that they will stop bothering us and we won't have to deal with them anymore? Um, and uh, yes, very shocking. Um, I hope it's not a sentiment you hear much uh, 25 years later, uh, but it was, I, I, I raise it because it was a framing of these agreements as a finality, as opposed to the beginning of a relationship. And, you know, certainly if when you look at the principles of federalism, it's, it's about ongoing relationships in this country uh, to reconcile balance and di uh, accommodate the diversity across the country. And it's about people getting together to say, how are we going to do this together? How are we going to be able to, you know, self-rule where we need to in our regions and our communities and so on? And where are we going to share uh, rule uh, and jurisdiction? Um, and that's you know fundamentally what the agreement at Confederation was about. Although, as Martin points out quite rightly, uh, not only were Indigenous people left out of any of the decision making around that, uh, and were never asked for their consent, but the whole process of Confederation was based on uh, an assumption that they didn't even really exist, and it was and it was based on an assumption of presumed sovereignty. Uh, by both the, the federal and provincial levels of power and presumed or assumed jurisdiction over the lands of Canada. And those are, those are some of the fundamental issues that we're still dealing with today. But I actually want to go back even farther because Martin mentioned this at the very beginning of his talk. And that is that for Indigenous people in this country, starting with the First Nations in, in Mi'kmaq territory who would have dealt with some of the first newcomers, there has been a continuing process of trying to uh, uh, arrange those relationships to talk about self-rule and shared rule uh, through peace and friendship treaties. Certainly, if you look at the two row wampum between the Haudenosaunee and the Dutch in 1613 or when, I mean, that's a very clear uh, agreement around how we're going to live together side by side and, and eat in our, our own uh, pathways traveling down this river. Um, I think it could even be argued that, uh, well, and I do argue it strongly as a Métis person, that uh, the, um, the resistance in Red River and then uh, about a decade later in Saskatchewan uh, were really about the people. And, and in that case, they were majority Métis people, but they're First Nations and, and others who were trying to negotiate their way into Confederation. They had been left out of the table there was once Rupert's land was sold and the Canadian government assumed that um, they would uh, have full jurisdiction over all of these areas and people who live there were, hey, wait a minute, um, you know, we wanna be able to discuss with you the basis on which we'll be part of this uh, federation as well. Um, and that was met with military action. Um, so what other sort of, um, Certainly, I think, you know, by Confederation and by um, 1876, with the latest version of the Indian Act at that time, uh, that was the, that was where they went from the presumed sovereignty and jurisdiction to actually actively trying to suppress any residual remaining rights that Indigenous people thought they might have uh, on their territories. Uh, and certainly even some of the, the number of treaties that were negotiated that time, even under uh, the pressures of starvation and uh, rapid settlement, the First Nations themselves still see those treaties as being agreements about uh, the terms under which they would share the land and continue to be able to, to self-rule. Um, didn't even get into treaties in British Columbia, which creates the present day problem. Um, but as people there uh, over the period of settlement were trying to 
uh, raise their issues and uh, negotiate uh, arrangements with both the provincial and Canadian governments at the time. They were met with, in fact, changes to the Indian Act that disallowed uh, or made it illegal for them to uh, seek representation, legal representation in the courts or hire lawyers to represent their interests with government. Uh, and that was actually, so there was a period of, of 50 years and probably more on either side where Canada deliberately uh, refused to entertain any of any questions in, in regards to the relationship. Um, fast forward, of course, to you know a period of, of uh, sort of rights awareness, court decisions, and ultimately Section 35 appearing in the Canadian Constitution uh, in 1982 with its repatriation uh, and the recognition of the existence of Aboriginal treaty rights. I think one of the important things to understand, for, again, from an Indigenous perspective, is that Section 35 um, was a was not uh, anything or is not anything that confers rights on Indigenous peoples. What it does is recognize uh, existing rights uh, and pre-existing rights and sovereignty. And that uh, notion is increasingly um, agreed to by Canadian courts. And it's one of the reasons that you see increasing agreements um, and uh, and changes in uh, relationships with both the federal government and provincial government. I love that chart, Martin, at the end in terms of of the the number, the increase of of agreements and interactions since 1995 is kind of a reflection of of that evolution of uh, of uh, increasing recognition of the rights and the relationships uh, and enduring relationships that. Uh, provinces and, and the federal government and territories need to have with indigenous people. Um, I would argue that much of that change has been driven by indigenous peoples themselves uh, and continues to be. And, and I think the pressures on, you know, our traditional notions of what the federation consists of, of what federalism is, Canada being just two orders of government is slowly being chipped away. Uh, with each new uh, arrangement, agreement, and, and court case um, that, uh, that is challenging those fundamental notions. Um, and there's certainly going to be a very significant one coming very soon from the Supreme Court in regards to uh, child and family services, which you know, really goes to that fundamental question of, of, uh, of jurisdiction um, and, and how jurisdictions between various orders of government need to be reconciled and that's going to be um, a, a very important case. Um, so you know that the, the weight of, of uh, evolutionary change uh, is starting to reach I think a, a tipping point in my view in Canada where um, accommodating and not, hopefully more than accommodating welcoming the changes in relationships between uh, Indigenous peoples and their governments and other orders of government in Canada um, is uh, is just going to be an increasing part of our business, um, and it's uh, and it's particularly important for public servants in advising uh, their governments to um, on on any relations uh, or issues dealing with Indigenous relations um, that. Uh, we are very cognizant and are providing uh, ministers with the full range of advice and information uh, about the changes, the history, uh, and, and the legal peril of, of not paying attention to these issues. Uh, you know, then Martin had a, a slide on consequences. Um, uh, I did too, or not a slide, but I, you know, was thinking about some of the consequences of not um, addressing and acknowledges uh, these changes as they go along, uh, allowing them to continue to go to court, um, as we did with you know, dealing with things like the Jordan Principle. Um, they have a human cost, uh, and in the continuing poor outcomes that, uh, that we see in far too many Indigenous communities in Canada, and they have a financial cost, and unfortunately a financial cost that usually lands on um, on the federal or provincial governments and, and basically and fundamentally on taxpayers. Um, and so, you know, it really is an important part of our jobs professionally to, uh, to be able to advise properly on these things. 
So in terms of what could we be doing, I mean, I, I'm not, and, I, and like Martin, I don't foresee a great transformation of the terms of, of confederation. Um, I think it will be more evolutionary in nature, uh, but it is, um, it is happening uh, right before our eyes. Um, and so, you know, there are many, many things um, that, you can, that can be done at the political level, certainly setting tone and direction um, as, uh, as the most recent uh, Liberal government did when they first came into power in 2015. Um, is, a, is an important uh, aspect of the work, um, but so too is aligning their decisions with the rhetoric um, of those promises. Uh, promises. Um, but I think importantly, what politicians can do is reframe, reframe the relationship for one that we have to think about as, you know, we have to manage, we've got to constrain it, we've got to limit it. Um, to, to one that is actually welcoming and accommodating um, and acknowledges that, that there is an ongoing relationship to be had in this country. In the public service, it basically comes down to educating yourself, making it a professional responsibility to understand the, the legal and historical re realities of the relationship, and particularly the day-to-day -day challenges of your counterparts uh, uh, in Indigenous communities. Um, and, and this can happen no matter where you work in government. It's not exclusive domain for CERNA and ISC. Um, indigenous issues touch on every aspect of government business. Um, and if you don't realize that, then uh, you need to find out what you don't know, because uh, I can guarantee you it does almost everything you do. Um, and just as you would consider what provincial or territorial concerns or issues might be in some of the work that you're working on, you really do also know, need to know where your department's mandate and activities might intersect with uh, or rub up against Indigenous rights and interests uh, and plan for it accordingly. And I think Darcy will be able to give you some examples of things that you might not have thought of uh, that really did create some big challenges for him and his community and some recent policy changes. Um, lastly, you know, I really encourage everyone to adopt a supportive mindset, which is doesn't mean that you you uh, you can capitulate, but that you can really think about where you can uh, streamline your service and program uh, delivery, do things more efficiently for recipients, where you can get out of the way of indigenous uh, of an indigenous community setting its own priorities and policies trusting them to know what's best for, for their own communities. Um, if you're even just looking at funding models, what, what's going to work best to support local priorities or need or their capacity needs and put accountability in the right places. Um, and Martin already touched on uh, some, of the, uh, some of the results of administrative burden that, that come when you don't do that. Um, but lastly, I would encourage everyone to be excited for where these changes might take us, not, not afraid of them, um, because they really are a reflection of who we say we are as a country. And I'll just close with um, our the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples uh, more than 20 years ago said, this is how they closed their report. And they said, Canada is a test case for a grand notion. The notion that dissimilar uh, peoples can share lands, resources, power, and dreams while respecting and sustaining their differences. The story of Canada is the story of many such peoples trying and failing and trying again to live together in peace and harmony. Thanks. Thank you, Catherine. That was, uh, that was wonderful. Um, so Darcy, I'll turn it to you to have the last word on the panel. Uh, and to perhaps give us a sense of, of how some of this uh, translates in very practical terms from the perspective of a, of a First Nations chief. So over to you. Um, thank you, uh, Walal and um, Danielle. Um, first off, Waldazi Don Deliem Giskuk. I'm very happy to be here with you today. WBC Darcy Gray, Delewi Akwigi Listuguch. So my name is Darcy Gray. I am from and, and I live in Listuguch. And uh, I also have to say, um, you know, well, uh, in Monique for Ukchit Sudamagan, thank you for the opening prayer and the good thoughts to get us started in a good way. Um, so um, I, I feel like the two speakers did a fantastic job of, of setting me up to try to close this in a good way. Uh, but also, I don't know how I'm going to do that in 15 minutes. 
um, it, it's very hard to know exactly what to share uh, and, and what to cover in, in these types of situations. Uh, myself, I worked as chief uh, for six and a half years uh, in our community. Uh, prior to that, I worked in education. Uh, I worked as a guidance counselor, uh, primarily supporting our, our students to be, uh, you know, encouraging their success in, in high school. And um, so I guess um, looking at some of the examples or some of the, the concepts that were shared, um, I need to give some context. So Listigwich is, uh, as Danielle had said, the, the westernmost uh, Mi'kmaq community. Uh, we are actually on, um, I guess, the, you'd say the Quebec, in the province of Quebec, um, along the Restigouche River. Uh, and on the other side of the Restigouche River is the province of New Brunswick. Um, so we are in a, in a unique situation in the fact that uh, there's a river that connects two provinces. Um, from our view, uh, we don't see that division. We don't see that divide or separation. Uh, you know, it's, it's Gespegawagi. It's the seventh district of Mi'kma'ki that we live in, and and it's it's a shared territory. It's 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 one territory, not two provinces. Um, we're about four thousand members um, that 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 are members of, of Listigouche, making us one of the larger Mi'kmaq communities. Um, and uh, we have a lot of capacity and and uh, for the most part our mindset is that you know we want to take care of things for ourselves um and and we try to do that uh across a number of of, of issues um I, i'm the one that probably jumps out to mind and is most obvious and and i would say is a, a example of success and in, in what can happen would be regarding our fisheries um I, I guess if if you want to get the full context, um, the impetus for moving so so hard and, and pushing so hard for our fisheries is first off, we have a, an amazing salmon fishing river or salmon river right in front of our community that has sustained our people for thousands of years. Uh, protecting the river, protecting the salmon and our relationship with the salmon is, is of the utmost importance. Um, so in, in um, you know, in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, this became a problem uh, for the province of Quebec, the fact that we were fishing in the river in a way that they felt was um, inappropriate. Uh, so in 1981, they raided our community uh, with hundreds of SQ officers arresting our people, um, you know, physically assaulting our people, um, telling us that we can't fish anymore and basically trying to take over the community. Um, we resisted, of course, uh, as the Shigoch does. Um, after that, uh, we decided that, uh, you know, it, it's important that we take on the work for ourselves to make sure that we continue to fish, but we continue to do it in a good way that is respectful of our ways, um, respectful, respectful of, of our values, and protecting that relationship we have with our, with our salmon. So, um, fast forward to uh, mid-90s, um, Lushigoch creates a, a law. Uh, a, a, a fishing law for itself, not under Indian Act uh, bylaw processes, but going back to our traditional uh, government processes of engaging with our people, uh, looking to our knowledge keepers, our elders, our regional uh, government reps uh, by district, and connecting that to the Grand Council of the, of the Mi'kmaq, the Sante Maliomi, which predates uh, Confederation. Um, so in doing so, we, we, we reassumed or, or took on the responsibility of managing the river and managing our relationship with that salmon, imp uh, implementing management regimes that uh, respect conservation and ensure that uh, we're respectful of the relationship we have with our salmon, but we're also able to feed our people and do things in a good way. And then we also created a ranger's law. And the ranger's law allowed us to enforce the law in a good way and keep disputes or issues that arise on the water internally. You know, it's, it's not going to a provincial court or a federal court to resolve a, a, a fishing issue on our river uh, that, that's going to come to a good understanding or a good, good result or, or changing of the behavior. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it was important that we take that on for ourselves. And we do that. And, you know, since then, uh, nobody has ever been charged for illegal fishing on our river. 
and we won an award uh, for one of the best or the best managed river uh, in Quebec. So obviously our people are doing good things in a good way, um, you know, building off of those traditions. Um, jump forward to um, during my administration, we were fortunate enough to, to be able to push that even further into the lobster law um, and look at how do we apply some of the concepts that have been talked about today. Um, you know, okay, and, and, and I, I, I guess it's important how we got to that lobster law was by community conversation, not consulting the community, but engaging the community on a very high level over a two year span. It was about getting to the heart of the matter of, okay, if you were to wipe away, you know, Fisheries Act, um, you know, provincial legislation or, or imposition of any of these, these rules and regulatory regimes, how would we as Mi'kmaq of Listigwitz want to go about fishing? What would be important to us? And from those conversations, we were able to shape the values and principles that guide our law. We got Ankodamuk, which is taking care of something in a careful manner. Abajiginwin, sharing and giving back. Get me data minute, which is about respect. Respect not just for ourselves, but respect for the lobster, respect for any species that we're, we're fishing. And wealth data mech, that we agree in thought. So these became the guiding principles for our law. They became how we interpret and look at our fishing activity and efforts. Our rangers were asked to not only um, monitor the fishing on the river, but the lobster fishing is out in the Baie des Chaleurs, uh, Chaleur Bay, which is a little down, down, down the way for us, a little out towards the, the sea. Um, so it required um, additional skill sets. It, it, it required, there was, there was safety regulations. There was other things that we had to do. We didn't ignore those. We took those on, took that on that responsibility to make sure that the rangers had the skills, the knowledge um, and, and the tools that they needed to be able to do this in a good and safe way. All the while we're negotiating with Canada on how we can implement coinciding sort of jurisdiction or, or regulatory regimes. It wasn't without challenge. It wasn't without a lot of <laughs> painstaking effort and conversation and relationship building. And uh, just, you know, I, I think we were helped by the pandemic in the fact that uh, the focus of what we had to talk about became very narrow. And because of the ability to connect virtually, you could meet really frequently. So we were able to really push this conversation and develop uh, common understanding, um, common themes, common issues, and realize that what we're pushing for in terms of salmon fishing or lobster fishing or, or any type of, uh, of uh, relationship we have with, with, with these species is not one that's detrimental to the species because we're not going anywhere. We've been here for thousands and thousands of years. The last thing we want to do is destroy the species. We want to preserve and protect the measures we're going to put in place are going to have that as the, as, as the most top priority. As an example, when our lobster fishermen come back from their fishing efforts, we have dockside monitoring. We have people literally counting the number of lobster that are caught. 10% of those lobster go straight back to the community to feed our elders, to feed those in need, to feed families. These are things that we are able to put in our law because they were important for our law. You won't find that in the Fisheries Act, but you find that in our law. And I don't think that that's a bad thing. But through the ongoing conversation, the ongoing relationship that was built with the people we were speaking with at the time, we we're able to come to that common understanding and get to a point where, okay. You know, the minister signs off and says, yes, let's, let's, let's give this a shot. But it doesn't stop there, right? We've been able to put in, into place committees, bodies that meet regularly to talk about what's the next step. 
It's not static. It's not stagnant. It has to continue to evolve. We have to continue to grow our, our, our effort and, our, and, um, and, and I guess not just the, the, the effort around fishing, but the effort to ensure that things are done in a good way. So we have a rangers training program that we've kicked off in partnership with a, with a college. But it's not the college that just comes in and delivers the course. We have a, a, a committee in the community that reviews the content of that course and ensures that it meets the standard of what we need for Listigooch. What do our rangers need? Not just learning about Quebec law or, or federal law, but Mi'kmaq law, Mi'kmaq values. That's what we're putting in place. What's very interesting is the rangers have asked after signing, after we signed a, uh, an enforcement protocol with TFO to map out how, how we uh, address any concerns that we might see on the water. They've asked for French second language courses in this program so that they can work better when they're collaborating with the DFO officers. Now, if you go back to 81, you would never have imagined that that type of request would be made, never. But here we are finding common ground where we can respect each other's jurisdiction, respect each other's approach to a fishery, despite that there are differences. And, and it's, not, it's not perfect. Um, and we do have some challenges. We do have people saying that it's a free for all. We do have people suggesting that we are going against conservation when the standard for conservation is higher than anywhere else, uh, as far as I know in any research we've done. And we do have scientific research that's being done in the territory to make sure that we're doing things in a good way. That's how we approach things in Listowich. We try to take on the whole, looking at the whole gamut of, of responsibilities and obligations that come with putting your rights into action, right? That collective responsibility that we have to each other. Um, I don't know if I have much, much time left, but um, I, I just wanted to share it. And I think Catherine made mention of, of you know, during the pandemic, uh, we saw the, the, the sort of the opposite of, of maybe a positive <laughs> approach to collaboration where um, because of our situation, we had obligations from uh, Quebec being imposed on us in terms of restrictions. And, and I know there were restrictions everywhere uh, that, that we all faced. But what was very unique uh, about, about Listigooch is, so we have a number of little dépanneurs or grocery stores, uh, uh, small convenience stores throughout the community, but we don't actually have like groceries. Uh, you can't buy clothes in the community. Um, we, we go to the New Brunswick side for that. We go to Camelton, New Brunswick, Atheville, New Brunswick. Um, so what happened is that you had New Brunswick completely close off access to the province from anybody outside. Um, as, as their, their, I guess, policy approach to keep people safe. Um, however, uh, you know, in, in, in doing so, they, they may have made an attempt to protect New Brunswickers, but they created a crisis situation for a lot of the local people in a very, uh, you know, local to Listigooch, and not just Listigooch, but Pointe à la Croix, our neighbors, uh, and even Camelton, because you have um, very complex relationships uh, that, that exist, where sometimes there's shared parenting and custody um, situations where one parent would be in New Brunswick, one parent is, is uh, in Listigooch, and how does somebody cross a bridge that's supposed to connect when it's been literally blocked off to disconnect? Um, so, you know, um, that was one, I, I think, an example that, you know, would have benefited from conversation up front, um, from an open dialogue and say, how do we keep people safe? That's the goal of everybody. We're, we're all doing the best we can. But how do we also recognize your local reality? And I think that's one of the keys going forward. If we really want to... Um, change the way we, we, we work or the way we do things is taking the time to listen and hear the differences in our local realities. Listigooch is different than Geskabegia, is different than Ukbiganjik, is different than Pabano. Um, 
you know, our situation in the pandemic was very unique. There's been economic studies that have been done since and the economic impact on Hamilton. But what's missing is sort of the, the, the health and well-being, the mental well-being of the people of Listigooch. Being told that you have to get permission to go buy underwear, to go buy socks. Being told that you can't go get certain items that you deem essential for your family. And yes, we understand that this is your traditional territory, but you can't go there. You know, and, and, and those kind of impacts are lasting and they're hard to work through. But it's through dialogue and, and continued conversation that I think we can get there. And uh, I imagine I'm done my time, but uh, thank you very much. And um, let's get to the questions. Okay. Thank you, Darcy. That's actually perfect. We are right on time at 2.30, so you're on the nose. <laughs> um, so I would encourage folks, we've got a couple of questions in the chat, but not a lot. Um, so if there are questions for the panel, please, um, please provide them. Um, maybe to kick it off, I, I have a question. Um, you know, we've talked about both the potential for, for federalism to help solve um, problems, but also posing some challenges in, in relationships, and particularly around the intersection between the federal system and Indigenous self-government. Um, and I know, perhaps I'll maybe start with Catherine on this question, given your experience in the Northwest Territories, where there are quite a few self-governing First Nations, as well as some non-self-governing First Nations. Um, you know, how, how do self-governing nations, um, you know, align, align their efforts uh, with, with this, this notion of federal territorial relations? And, and how, what does that look like in practice? Because I think there's some really interesting models uh, emerging in the North that uh, can be instructive for those of us uh, south of 60. Sure. Uh, well, yes, there are emerging models, but uh, you know, I think it's important to say that um, you know some of the self-government agreements are you know are going back to you know being at least fifteen, almost twenty years old, and it's um, it, they have not been implemented faithfully by uh, federal or provincial or territorial counterparts. Um, and that has actually been a problem. It goes back to my my early story. A lot of people on the, the in the federal and provincial or territorial governments figures you get it signed and then it's done and you don't have to deal with people anymore. So um, you know what Northwest Territories is actually unique, I think, just because of, of uh, you know the demographics and the structure of the population. It's you know, more than 50%. Indigenous, um, there are many Indigenous communities, um, even Yellowknife um, as a majority white community still has uh, very large Indigenous populations. The territorial government um, uh, representation um, is, uh, I believe now, uh, majority Indigenous in terms of elected uh, officials, has had uh, Indigenous uh, premiers uh, for at least the last two or three rounds. Uh, and more often, so you have you you have a an, an openness to the relationship that's just kind of baked into the system, um, and so you know where um, there have been sort of several iterations, and I actually don't know how well things are functioning currently, but you actually have a system whereby um, the territorial governments um, and the in, heads of indigenous governments uh, meet regularly. Um, and they don't legislate together. They each keep their own um, sort of uh, powers to self-rule, uh, but they work out issues together on a regular basis. So there are uh, regular multilateral meetings between all of them up and down the valley and with the territorial government. The territorial government also, uh, and the legislative assembly has taken a different approach to creating legislation and actually starts um, not with a draft, but in uh, engagement with the Indigenous governments in terms of, and, and this is a relatively new uh, thing that they've, they've been doing as well, and I should know which piece of legislation it was most recently done with, but it was, you know, it has turning out to be a successful model. So things actually come into the legislature that have already 
been developed to a certain extent with the other indigenous governments. Um, but it is worth pointing out that in terms of, uh, although there are a number of self-governments uh, now throughout the Northwest Territories, at least they have self-government agreements, uh, they are self-governing around a core of, of you know, internal interests, whether it's language or education, um, that even there, um, that people are still uh, relying on sort of service delivery arrangements with the territorial government in order to to get certain things done. So they haven't they haven't drawn down fully their education jurisdiction, for example, and are are operating it independently. Um, although you know that that evolution could still uh, and may still take place even sooner rather than later. So so that's kind of how it works up there. I hope that addresses what you were looking for. Thank you. Yes. Um, so now I have a question from the chat. Uh, it's directed to Martin. Um, and it's, it's kind of a funny question. It says, um, are there any suggestions for the federal government on how to make practical progress despite reluctance and resistance of some provincial governments? Uh, and I think likewise, you, you might also be able to turn that question on its head the other, the other way as well. Um, but I'd invite you to, to share some thoughts on uh, um, you know, how do you overcome resistance from from any one of the parties that potentially have yeah, to take? Uh, 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 there's resistance coming from many places, and mm -hmm. you, you opened the door to me reversing the, the question. I think mm -hmm. resistance is coming from from within the federal government, at least as much as from the provincial or territorial governments. The uh, vested interest is different, obviously. It depends what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're talking about expenditures, jurisdiction, uh, you know, it, it, there's, there's the, the, the nature of the resistance is different. And uh, Darcy talked about concrete examples where it was possible to negotiate agreements based on uh, uh, an assertion of authority uh, uh, and lawmaking authority from the Mi'kmaq. Um, mm -hmm. It's a great example where, you know, for the, for, uh, but the federal uh, fisheries, this this has impact, but the impact is perhaps less uh, less less complicated or complex than in other cases. Say, for example, where a um, uh, an indigenous people would assert jurisdiction on on mining or you know forestry uh, that have much greater implications and directly impact uh, provincial. Um, Provincial economic interests in a much more concrete way. So it really varies on, on a case by case basis. So I, I just want to, I'm going to use this question to talk a bit because um, uh, Catherine mentioned the important uh, court decisions, Supreme Court decision that's going to come on um, child welfare and the origin of this. Uh, uh, litigation is really Quebec that is challenging the uh, the constitutionality of the uh, federal legislation on uh, child welfare, uh, uh, First Nation child welfare, um, and and so uh, I've talked to Quebec officials on this because it, it looks like Quebec is really the bad guy in this story, and like federal government is generously recognizing the authority and jurisdiction of First Nations on child child welfare. Um, but uh, yeah, we have to keep in mind that for provincial governments that are running their uh, child welfare system, um, there is there is also a concern that uh, not so much that the child welfare systems that are being developed by indigenous communities are not good or not consequent and so on and so forth, but there is a concern to, to sort of be able to coordinate these things. And if the relationship is just with the federal government between the federal government and the, and the indigenous communities, this is not happening. So essentially what Quebec is saying is, hey, we, want, we should have been part of the conversation. Provinces should have been part of the conversation in establishing this framework. Uh, and, and, so, uh, and so that resistance is coming from there. This comes back to something that I've said before, which is that, these changes, these evol evolutions are very slow, but they're much more uh, effective and successful when they involve everyone uh, in, in, included and in, in the, when they everyone is part of that conversation. And this is, this is a real example of this. So the resistance of provinces when it's encountered, it's very often because quite frankly, because the federal government didn't think of talking to the provinces and, and, and their, their concern and their jurisdiction in changing things. And, and it's annoying in many ways because it's adding another complication. It's adding another source of resistance. It's adding another uh, 
you know, source, uh, mul multiplication of interest and so on and so forth. And uh, First Nation and other indigenous organizations and governments that are engaged with the federal government in changing things are not very keen on this because it further complicates things. But in the long term, from the number of cases that I've looked at, uh, it actually ends up working better. And you know, when the province is involved or the territory is involved in these in these in these changes, so it can be double bilateral. It could be federal. Uh, you know, the, the example of the Northern Territories with the treaties is a good one. There's there's bilateral relation with the with the federal government, obviously, but also with the, the with the territorial government. But there are other models where it's more tripartite, and um, and these tend to be also. Uh, probably uh, more conducive to reducing conflicts or uh, avoiding uh, uh, litigation the way we're, we're seeing now. Thank you. Uh, so I have another question. I'm going to I'm going to turn to Darcy for this one, and it's it's a bit of a two part question. I'm I'm cheating a little bit and combining some questions, um, but the question from the chat is: From a community member's perspective, do you think the provinces are more open to consultation with First Nations than the federal government? Uh, so that's part one. Um, and then uh, the part two, uh, you know, you talked about the fisheries issues. What do you think is the next big issue, um, intergovernmental issue that, that your community will face? Sorry, I'm just writing down so I don't, uh, <laughs> I, I don't forget them. I can repeat if you need. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. Um, so it, I guess in terms of the consultation and accommodation, um, my experience with that is is that it is entirely problematic. Um, it, it, I think it's ineffective and and leads to more issue than it does uh, resolving issues. Um, we're consulted on everything, which is, I suppose, good. But at the same time, we are communities with limited capacity. Um, I know myself as chief, like in in the role you're you're dealing with municipal governments, local like people, your community members, you're dealing with neighboring First Nation communities, you're dealing with provincial governments, you're dealing with federal governments, day-to-day -day operational issues, and then trying to plan and move ahead and, and deal with all these things, plus some time for your family. And then you get consultations, you know, can we put a culvert here? Can we add a road there can we you know and 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 they're they're just kind of just a steady stream of 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 information and it almost seems like there's no differentiation between say a mine and a culvert or sometimes the consultation depending on the the way the legislation is written like when it came to um exploration or exploitation of, of oil and gas we didn't get those consultations about oil and gas we got the consultation about the road that would lead to the drilling of the well the deforestation so it, it's really hit and miss and i and i think it's um you know as as a chief it was problematic as a community member it would be fantastic if we could get that information out to you know our 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 rights holders our 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 people and let them know what is planned for the territory what's being considered in, in a in a good way and then find some way to include not just be seen as the the um the opposition to to um projects or or a development, right? Which which it it it, tend, it ends up being or or seeming like, where um, you know as as Martin has said, if if there was an inclusive conversation uh, up front, perhaps the end result would be much better. You know, and and I think that that's really the way consultation and accommodation has has been approached to date hasn't been um, as effective as it could. And, and I think it's more about getting to that negotiation. Um, and the other one, the next big issue, um, I think it, it, it comes down to that, right? You have more and more um, opportunity that is coming in the territory. You have, um, I would say in a good way, more and more of these proponents and, 
and uh, potential partners coming to meet with your community, coming to engage in those conversations. But if you don't have the capacity to take up those conversations or get involved in a, me a meaningful way, then the way forward is, is, is going to be difficult. And a lot of times in our communities, we don't have um, the experts on standby just waiting to take up this, you know, uh, the potential mega project or as well as deal with the, you know, the, the, the potential issue you might have with the culvert. So it's, it's, it's really a, a capacity issue, I think, uh, coming up with these, these major opportunities that are coming. Thank you. And any thoughts on kind of the next big issue that's in front of you? Well, to me, that that's it, right? Is it's it's that um, there are going to be big opportunities, big issues coming, um, big projects. Um, if let's say a proponent does come and say we want you to be part of this, mm -hmm. not every community has the capacity to respond mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. In fact, a lot of us don't. You know, we we, we don't. Um, you, you have to build that up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, and to get that meaningful engagement, and and that takes time. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, to me, that that that's the way I see it is really a capacity issue, and to to, to be meaningful, meaningfully involved mm -hmm. in in what's going on. Thanks, Danielle. Can I just yeah. jump in on sure. this one? Because I, this is something I saw when I was most recently with the government of the Northwest Territories. And it was actually a, a federal issue because I know people within the federal government have been doing a lot of thinking about. Well, and also been told, don't forget about the duty to consult, et cetera. But what, what I saw was, and this goes back to my point about, you know, be thoughtful about what the heck you're doing, uh, you know, with Indigenous partners or to Indigenous partners. Mm -hmm. Because what I saw was um, out of fear and, and worry that they weren't consulting enough. Uh, when all of the infrastructure funds were going into communities into the Northwest Territories, there was a really high bar set by the, uh, the, the funders for consultation and accommodation discussions at the, like the most significant level with, pro with project proponents, most of whom were themselves Indigenous communities. And so the territorial government was going we don't need to do all this consultation and, you know, accommodation under, under the duty to consult because it's indigenous proponents. Um, and unfortunately it was, and in the communities themselves are going, what the heck? Um, but unfortunately we could not at that time, I hope it's changed since, uh, convince uh, the folks within the federal public service that, you know, to back down a bit. And, you know, and then it goes to what, Darcy's talking about is you're consulting people on, you know, on things and stripping the capacity of them to actually be paying attention to the bigger things. Mm -hmm. So think about that. Thanks. Um, did, something struck me um, mm -hmm. as, as you all were talking. Um, and in particular, you know, Darcy gave us a really practical example of the kind of collaboration that can happen at the community level when you get the right partners in the room uh, around, you know, the fisheries issue in that case. I think in, in my own experience where it gets more complex um, is when you start to move out to broader, you know, policy development. And Martin gave the example of the legislative development types of questions. Um, and in particular, from the Indigenous side, questions around representation, whether it's in bilateral or multilateral processes. And if you're going to call a first minister's meeting, it's obvious Canada sends the prime minister, the provinces send the premiers. I think, um, and Meltan, you touched on it in the very beginning, there's a tremendous diversity uh, within and across Indigenous nations. And so one of the challenges we often face um, is, you know, what is the right level of Indigenous representation in these forums, recognizing, you know, national organizations are not rights holders. And so where, you know, where are the best uh, opportunities to make progress and, and progress that's going to be credible um, and legitimate in the eyes of Indigenous partners? Is it, is it through kind of regional processes, bilateral processes, um, big national multilateral um, discussions. I'd, I'd invite all three of you to, to share your views on that, because I think that is something we struggle with across, you know, all departments. We have a fairly well-established 
you know, federal provincial territorial system of ministers meetings. Um, but how do we bring uh, Indigenous voices to that table in, in the most effective and, and credible way? Well, maybe I can I can start. Um, I think the um, it has to be it has to happen at multiple levels. So it has to be uh, you know at the very local level, regional, uh, at the nation level, at the the national level. Um, it's uh, the 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 there's there's a there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting paradox as the the more uh, indigenous organizations of, or or indigenous people and communities exercise autonomy and jurisdiction, in fact, the more important intergovernmental relations become. There's not less, and this is a point that really Catherine emphasized, you know, once there's an agreement, it's just the beginning, and it's beginning, and it's really important, I think, and, and, and so uh, we're not, because there's more autonomy, there's actually more relationship, there's a greater role for a different kind of people, a different kind of civil servants. Uh, well, it could be the same people, but the role is different. Where the role used to be running programs and you know thinking our, amongst ourselves and sort of deciding, now the role is relational, right? And so, but that that doesn't mean that there's less resources invested in in this. Uh, uh, the resources are of a different type. Type. It's time. It's a different kind of expertise, and so on and so forth. The question of who to talk to or who is the right partner at the indigenous level for this, really, I think depends on the context on the issue and so on and so forth. But it also depends on indigenous peoples themselves, how they view their relationship with federal and provincial authorities. And in some case, the engagement will have to be at the community levels. In some cases, it's going to be at the, the nation level. For example, I've, I've worked a lot with the Jane Bay Cree in Quebec, and you know their, their nation-based system of governance is very effective for intergovernmental relations. That's a good example of a nation that has kind of consolidated through the Jane Bay Northern Quebec Agreement and has kind of created this form of governance that is really effective for intergovernmental relations, but there are other examples. So that and that's an example. The big gap right now, in my view, and this is my humble opinion, I might be wrong on this and other people may have different opinion, but I find that the, 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 the problem or the gap is at the provincial and federal level. Who talks on behalf of indigenous people at those levels? And I don't wanna diss the Assembly of First Nation and other provincial organizations. Uh, they're doing what they can, but they have a fundamental problem of representation where they're representing chiefs, they're represent, they're not representing people, and they don't have any authority. So when you're engaging in intergovernmental relations with these organizations, it becomes very complex to uh, engage in transformative policy development because of you know, the sort of lack of authority and representation that they have. There's ways around this, but there's also alternative models that could be interesting to consider. I'm not saying that Canada should do that, but for example, having what uh, Scandinavian countries have, which is an indigenous parliament. Now it's much more complex in Canada because you know there's a diversity of indigenous people in Scandinavian countries. It's only Sami, but um, but that model, that idea of having a legislative body that is elected by indigenous people at the federal or provincial level uh, is one example. For example, where it's much clearer who you're talking to, and the legitimacy of that body is much stronger. Again, there's a whole bunch of problems with that kind of model for Canada, but that, that is to say that the existing model right now with those organizations is not the only one that's possible. And, uh, but really it's not up to the federal government or provincial government to decide that. It's really up to indigenous people themselves to decide how they want to interact with those, uh, with, with Canadian federalism. Thank you. Any other thoughts on that question, Catherine or Darcy? Well, I have a couple, but I'd like Darcy to go first because uh, he has lived this every day. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think the first, first and most important thing is that uh, you know it, it can't be an imposed uh, approach, and I think in some of the um, some of the negotiations that we we had engaged in, or some of the processes that we engaged in, that was the the preferred. Um, method, right? Is so you've got uh, the three Mi'kmaq communities in the Quebec region. That who who's your spokesperson? Who's your one person that represents all three? And uh, if we're going to sign an agreement, it's with all three of you together. So who's signing that 
agreement. But internally between the three communities, we've never engaged in that process and we've never given that authority as the three chiefs and certainly not as community members or, or Mi'kmaq people, right? So, so, so nobody has that authority um, and, and we have to respect the autonomy of each community. Now, it's not to say that these conversations aren't being had. And, uh, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to be part of a few where all of the, the chiefs throughout Mi'kma'ki came together and started having these conversations. And I mean, talk about empowering and, and, and great conversations. But you're not going to get uh, one singular Mi'kmaq chief that represents all Mi'kmaq people. We're not there yet. Um, I think if you go pre-Confederation, you go back to, you know, 400 years ago, there was a process to getting to that consensus where there was a spokesperson, but through colonization, we've kind of lost those processes and, and it's about rebuilding them. I think that's perhaps a perfect segue into some of the work Catherine's doing on, uh, on rebuilding governance. So Catherine, I'll, I'll let you have the last word. <laughs> um, well, I guess I was two things. One, um, I, you know, particularly if this is largely a federal audience watching, please don't assume that by simply working with the three representative organizations or five, if we ever let CAP and Native Women's back in, that um, that, that is going to satisfy um, uh, policy consultation across this country uh, for all the reasons Martin said. And, uh, and I know why we do it, because it's easy. Um, but you don't generally, in my experience, get come, you know, for all the effort that goes in, get the best outcome. So that's one thing. And then the other sort of more to what Darcy is talking about um, is that don't assume that if you're working with an individual community and that, that the chief and council itself is even in a position to be able to give you, you know, to sign an agreement or give you a decision on behalf of the community. Because as, as I think we start to see in many very public issues, um, the, there are still hereditary systems in place. There are still traditional systems in place and they, um, for the most part, you know, do not, um, the chief and council do not speak for the rights holders. They are a creature of the Indian Act administration. Uh, so you need to be really aware of who has been given the authority and power to, to speak on behalf. And, and as Darcy said, you know, it, if you find that frustrating, um, you know, you have only the Indian Act to think for the current situation. Um, we spent 150 years in this country and more dividing all of these people into tiny little reserves and communities and setting them aside. Um, you can't blame them for uh, not suddenly coming together again as nations. Um, and so that's going to take time. It's going to take lots of conversations. And so some of the work that we're doing, uh, we actually have acknowledged that we've got to start at a community level. Um, that's probably the, the, you know, the place to start. And as people develop confidence again in their systems, in their governments, um, that those nations will eventually be rebuilt, but um, that's, I think, in most parts of the country, still a ways off. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so we're almost at the end of our time here. So I just wanted to take a moment to thank all three of you for joining us today. Uh, it was a very, uh, you know, informative, engaging discussion. I know I, I work in this space, intergovernmental relations is part of my responsibility. Um, but uh, I know I definitely uh, learned from, from all three of you and it's, it's it caused me to reflect on, on some of the work we're doing, um, you know, from yeah. public servants taking a, you know, needing to take that long-term view of the relationship, um, you know, recognizing the complexity, I think is, you know, uh, Darcy pointed out, the unintended consequences sometimes of federal and provincial policy decisions. And we saw a lot of that during COVID for sure, um, including in, in some of the areas I work in. Um, and you know, the, the, the really important questions around governance and capacity uh, and consultation and the importance of, you know, recognizing 
um, you know, the priorities of communities and nations. And it's not just about what a federal or a provincial government has a, an obligation to consult on that we need to seek that broader alignment around, around priorities. Uh, and how we approach things is often as important as, as the substance itself. Um, I've been advised that Monique has not been able to reconnect uh, to do a closing prayer, which is really too bad, because um, I know she would have sent us all off uh, in a good way. So I will I will uh, bring it to a close here. I would just remind um, participants to complete the evaluation forms. Um, that the uh, the evaluation the feedback is very important in in terms of informing. Uh, the way forward. Uh, lots more events on the horizon from the Canada School around as part of the Indigenous Learning Series. And um, I would really thank you all again for joining us. Miigwech, uh, Wolaliak, merci beaucoup. Thank you and, uh, and be well. Thanks, Sonia. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. And we'll talk soon.